American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. If you like American Catholic History, please help others find it by sharing this episode and giving us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today, we're talking about a haunting. I mean, it seems appropriate since this episode is being released just before Halloween with all of the costume parties, haunted houses, hayrides, and trick-or-treating. Yes, but this is a real haunting, which went on for years, and it really seems to have been a full-on demonic possession. We're talking about the legend of Wizard Clip. Now, just the name makes you want to know more. Wizard Clip. Two words you don't generally associate with each other. You expect something like wizard spell or wizard hollow or wizard forest, something that carries the narrative or suggests a location where something sinister happened. But clip, I mean, that's so unexpected, it just begs to be investigated. And that's just what we're doing, because this story just makes the hair rise on the back of your neck. Yeah, it does. It involves a mysterious stranger, a sudden death, a burial in non-hallowed ground, a series of incredible and terrifying phenomena, and a real-life spiritual battle resulting in an exorcism. But the exorcism wasn't the end of the story either, though the supernatural phenomena changed from terrifying to edifying. I don't know. I'd still be weirded out by you know, this disembodied voice just sort of hanging around, even if it was inspiring me to do good things. Yeah. Kind of strange. But we'll get to that part of the story in a bit. Let's begin the story of Wizard Clip with Adam Livingston. Dr. Livingston, I presume? He was a farmer and not a doctor. No, it Stanley. Lord Stanley. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so Adam Livingston was a farmer in Pennsylvania in the latter portion of the 1700s. In 1792, he moved his family to a large farm, some 350 acres, in Berkeley County, Virginia. Now, to put this story on the map, literally, the community was known as Smithfield, Virginia at the time. But since the events of today's story took place, the town nearby incorporated as Middleway, Virginia. Jefferson County separated off of Berkeley County, and West Virginia separated from Virginia. So the modern-day locale we're talking about is Middleway, Jefferson County, West Virginia. Exactly. Which means, da-da-da, we've finally done at least one story about each of the 50 states. West Virginia was the final one. Yes, and if people go to our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org, they can search by state, seeing all episodes that have something to do with that state. And when I say search by state, I mean we have a map, and you can click on the particular state you want to find out about, and it'll pull up all those yep. episodes. It's a really cool feature. Yeah, we try to make things convenient for listeners with... We, and with, a, with 119 episodes that we've recorded so far, we've got a lot of great stuff on there. So people should go and check it out. Definitely. But back to Adam, Adam Livingston and Wizard Clip. Livingston moved his family to this large farm in 1792. Some accounts of his travails indicate that he had already been beset by strange happenings before he moved to Virginia, but that isn't universally agreed upon. Um, so can you explain what sort of things? Sure. Like his barn inexplicably caught fire and all of his livestock died. And according to these accounts, some of these things followed him to his new farm in Virginia. But again, the various accounts aren't in agreement on this point. Also, none of the earlier things that were alleged compared to the incredibleness of what happened later. The event that kicked off the truly terrifying part of the Livingston's experience was the visit and death of a stranger in 1794. Now, strangers stopping and asking for lodging was not uncommon at the time. There were few inns, and hospitality was happily extended to anyone who happened to stop by. So the Livingstons were happy to welcome a stranger into their home for a few days. The problem arose when the stranger took ill shortly after arriving. 
naturally, he was obliged to remain until he got better. But he didn't get better. In fact, it became apparent that death was approaching. The man summoned Livingston to his bedside and told him that he was Catholic. He implored Livingston to find a priest and bring him to the house to give him last rites. Now, this was a problem for Adam Livingston for a couple of reasons. First, there simply weren't any Catholic priests around. Catholicism had only recently been legalized in Virginia, and no Catholic presence had really established itself in the area as yet. Second, even if there were a Catholic priest nearby, Livingston was a devout Lutheran in an age of great animosity toward Catholicism, so the request would have given him pause regardless. Some accounts say he simply refused the request with prejudice and that he was indignant at the thought of a Catholic priest entering his house. Other accounts are more charitable towards Livingston, saying that he was open to the idea but simply had no idea where to even begin looking for a Catholic priest. Either way, the man died without the benefit of the sacraments. And that night, the major manifestations of some strange things began to occur. As was custom, that evening Livingston hired a man to come and sit in the room with the corpse through the night. As the man settled in, suddenly all of the candles in the room went out. The man relit them, thinking a breeze had blown them out, though he had felt no breeze. But within moments, they went out again. He summoned Livingston to the room, and Livingston brought with him the candles that he and his family had been using in the sitting room downstairs. But once they were in the room, these candles also went out and would not relight. The man bolted from the house, so terrified by the sign. The next morning, Livingston buried the corpse in unhallowed ground, not even knowing the man's name. And the next day, additional signs began to appear. Horses could be heard galloping loudly past the house, though there were none there. The chicken and geese on the farm would suddenly die as their heads and legs would fall off. Now, that's just strange. Yeah. That crockery and clay pots would just fly off of shelves and smash on the floor. A bag of money, which Livingston had kept in a locked chest, just disappeared. Burning logs would come bounding out of the fireplace and just shoot across the floor, threatening to burn the house down. Once, when a group of young men who were skeptical of the claims of strange occurrences came to see for themselves, a large stone came bouncing out of the fireplace and proceeded to spin on the floor. And perhaps the strangest and most ominous of the occurrences was the clipping. Yes, and this is where the name of the mystery comes in. A clipping sound, like a pair of very large scissors, was audible constantly in and around the Livingston's house. With this clipping sound, curtains, bedsheets, and clothing would be either cut to shreds, or they would have shapes of crescent moons cut into them. The crescent moon shape would also appear cut into the skin of their livestock. The townspeople heard the stories and shared them among themselves. One fine, upstanding Presbyterian woman heard the stories and wanted to see for herself, so she went to the Livingston's home. When she arrived, she took her new silk hat off her head and wrapped it in her silk handkerchief and placed it in her pocket. After her visit, when she took her hat out of her pocket and unwrapped it, she found that it had been cut to ribbons while still wrapped and remaining in her pocket. But the handkerchief was fine. That's just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Livingston and his family were pretty well terrified by the happenings, and they could make no sense of it. By this point, the story of the mysterious clipping had become so well known that the town came to be known as Wizard Clip. Seeking help, Livingston went to his Lutheran pastor, but his pastor said there was nothing he could do. Dealing with supernatural phenomena was not his thing. So he went to a Methodist minister who actually came to the house and prayed, but quickly realized he was out of his depth. Livingston apparently also approached an Episcopalian priest, but he too demurred. Then one night, Livingston had a dream. He dreamt he climbed a large and steep hill to a beautiful church, and in the church he saw a man dressed in what he described as robes. He'd never seen that kind of dress before. He heard a voice say, This is the man who will bring you relief. He told his wife about his dream, and he told others. Someone finally told him that the robes he described were those worn by a Catholic priest. At first, he did nothing, not wanting to approach a Catholic priest. 
But after a while, his wife prevailed upon him to find the man in his dreams. He made further inquiries and found out there was a Catholic family by the name of McSherry who lived in Lee Town, only a few miles away. He went to the McSherry's and asked about a priest. They told him that there wasn't one in Lee Town at the time, but Father Dennis Cahill would be in Shepherdstown the following Sunday. So he went the 13 miles to Shepherdstown the following Sunday, and upon seeing Father Cahill come out of the sacristy at the beginning of Mass, he exclaimed, The very man I saw in my dream. He waited until after Mass and visited Father Cahill, explaining in detail everything that had been afflicting his family. Father Cahill didn't take him seriously at first. He was not disposed to believe him, nor even to go to the Livingston house. But some of the parishioners who were present for the interview affirmed to Father Cahill that the story of Wizard Clip was widely known, and he should at least go to see for himself. Father Cahill consented. Upon arrival at the Livingston homestead, he observed the phenomena for himself. After a short time, he pulled out the holy water and book of rituals and did a quick and simple blessing of the house, sprinkling holy water all around. The effect was almost immediate. The noises died down even as he was sprinkling the holy water. And as he was leaving, the bag of money, which had disappeared from the locked chest, appeared on the doorstep as though it was placed there by invisible hands. The phenomena stayed away for a time, but not forever. When they restarted, Father Cahill wasn't the one who came. By this time, word had reached John Carroll, Bishop of Baltimore, and he asked a priest whom he knew well to look into the matter. The priest whom he chose is an old friend of ours here at American Catholic History, Father Demetrius Galitzin. Yes, Prince Galitzin, the Russian prince who became Catholic, came to the U.S. and became the second priest ordained in the U.S. and the first to do his entire seminary studies in the new United States. We told his remarkable story in episode 10. Be sure to check it out. He was 27 years old and had only been ordained for five years at the time he became involved in this story, but he was very educated and worldly 27, being the son of the Russian ambassador to the Netherlands and having spent his youth in the posh salons of European nobility. So he was not one to be taken in, nor was he one to poo-poo the existence of malicious spirits and supernatural manifestations. But he needed to be sure, so he went to the Livingstons and stayed with them for three months. He observed the phenomena himself, and he interviewed, practically interrogated, the entire family about the entire affair. After his investigation, he wrote that he was well convinced that the phenomena were of supernatural origin, and he believed a formal exorcism was called for. He called the entire Livingston family together and had them kneel and pray while he began the exorcism ritual. But as he did so, the noises and rumblings and rattlings in the house became so severe that he could not maintain his composure and focus. He stopped the ritual and summoned Father Cahill to return with him and assist in the prayer of exorcism. Together, in spite of the noises and rattlings and rumblings, with the Livingstons present and praying, they performed the rite of exorcism. At the conclusion of the rite, the manifestations ceased, this time for good. Father Cahill offered a mass of thanksgiving there in their house. The Livingstons, so grateful for the deliverance and so impressed by the ability of these two Catholic priests to bring it about, became Catholic. But the story doesn't end there. No, like we said, the troublesome manifestations gave way to manifestations of a more benign, edifying sort. After the Livingstons became Catholic, everything went back to normal for a time. But then one night, Adam Livingston was awakened from sleep by a bright light and a voice. The voice was sweet and consoling. It comforted Livingston and exhorted him to get up and wake his family that they might pray together. The voice led the family in prayer that night and began to instruct them in the truths of the Catholic faith. This instruction was helpful for the whole family because their education in the faith had been nearly non-existent. They converted due to the exorcism, not because they were convinced by Catholic arguments. Right. If the Catholic faith could drive away demons, it must be the faith of Christ. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so this new consoling voice became their guide. The voice could be heard by all members of the family and even by visitors. The Livingston children reported that they were able to see the entity who was speaking, but they never really offered a real description. 
But based on the exhortations given by the voice, it seems the spirit speaking may have been a soul in purgatory. It may well have been the soul of the stranger who died in their home without the sacraments. Some say it was a priest. Either way, the voice instructed them very clearly on the intentions to pray for individuals who needed prayer, whether living or deceased. One time, this exhortation took a very real form and not just a voice. It seemed that one of the girls thought that souls in purgatory didn't really deserve prayers because, well, probably they could have just helped themselves when they were alive. Suddenly, a voice could be heard screaming for help, and when they asked what the voice needed, it said, prayers, for we are in excruciating torments. And then a vision of a burning hand appeared and burned its impression on a bed linen in the room. The message was received, pray for those in purgatory. Yeah, that would have sent a message to me as well. Yeah. (laughs) As for the living, Adam Livingston would be directed by the voice to go at all hours of the day and night to the aid of some persons in need, whether they were close to death or just enduring some sort of hardships. He often did not know the people, and the journeys could be great distances, but he went. After the turn of the 19th century, the Livingstons moved back to Pennsylvania. They settled on a farm near Loretto, the town which Father Glisson had established as a Catholic haven. The voice, of course, traveled with them. The voice would remain with the family for 17 years, ceasing in about 1814. Adam Livingston would live for another six years, dying in 1820. But before the Livingstons returned to Pennsylvania, Adam Livingston donated 34 acres of his property to the Catholic Church. One explanation given for this gift is that during the exorcism, the possessing spirit said that one of the previous owners of the property had taken possession of it by murdering its rightful owner. Livingston, therefore, guided by the voice, gave over that chunk of property to the church as an atonement for the previous owner's evil deed. The land was given over specifically to be a place where priests could pray and have rest. The property was used in different ways over the years, mostly as a cemetery. In 1923, the diocese built a chapel on the property, which became a place of pilgrimage. In 1978, the property became a retreat center, which it remains to this day. Many have investigated the historical claims about Wizard Clip and how much of the story can be believed at face value. In August of last year, our friend on the StarQuest Production Network, Jimmy Aiken, did an episode of his Mysterious World podcast on Wizard Clip, and he, along with Dom Bettinelli, looked into the accounts and explanations of the mystery. You'd do well to listen to that episode, which we'll link to in our show notes. But the long and short of it is, those involved in the events believed that the various phenomena were of supernatural origin, first demonic, then kindly. Many came to believe in Christ and the Catholic faith because of these events, and the church has a lovely retreat center in the easternmost county of West Virginia, thanks to the strange occurrences at Wizard Clip. You've been listening to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help others find it by sharing this episode and by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. Also, please support the many fine productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. To learn more about Wizard Clip, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimages to important and unforgettable Catholic holy sites, please visit AmericanCatholicHistory.org. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH 1513. I'm Noelle Heaster-Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest. <laughs> <laughs>